Welcome to today's conversation series program, Women in Leadership. Margot Hoyt, Managing Director, Talent and Leadership Development at LHH, will be speaking with Beth Wilson, Canada Chief Executive Officer at Denton. Today, Margot and Beth are talking about what it means to be a woman in the workplace, both today and as we look to the future. We'll be taking questions at the end of the conversation. Please use the Q&A function to enter your questions anytime during the session, and we'll be able to respond to as many questions as possible. Hosting today's program is Margot Hoyt. Over to you, Margot. Thanks, Laura, and welcome, everyone. I'm excited to be here for the fifth and the final in our Women in Leadership Conversation Series 2021. It's been a great success and we've had some really interesting conversations over the last five weeks. Today, I'm sure will also be a terrific bookend to this series. Um, for those of you who are new to LHH, we work with companies to find the possibilities in their people. So as you transform your organizations and restructure, we're there with assessment and succession services, coaching and development, career development strategies, and of course, career transition when required. We started this conversation series in celebration of International Women's Day and looking for an opportunity to celebrate the accomplishments of some terrific women executives um, and also to find inspiration and advice for those of us who are still working to advance our careers and to advance women and find equity in our own organizations. I'm sure that today's conversation will be no different and we're thrilled to have Beth Wilson with us. Let me give you a quick bio before we get started, and then we'll jump right into our questions. Beth is currently the Dentons Canada CEO, as Laura said, and a member of the global leadership team there. For those of you who don't know, Dentons is the world's largest law firm. While not a lawyer, Beth is no stranger to professional services. Prior to becoming the CEO at Dentons, she spent 26 years at KPMG Canada. She's a CPA. And she had 11 years of C-suite experience there in a variety of leadership roles. Her last one was as the Toronto Managing Partner, and that's KPMG Canada's largest business unit. That is known for being results-oriented, an inspirational change driver, passionate for empowering female leaders, and absolutely committed. And this applies not only to her work in the corporate world, but also to her work in the community. She's held significant leadership roles with United Way Greater Toronto and currently is the chair of the advisory board at Catalyst Canada. Over her career, she's been lauded in many ways, including being selected among the top 25 Canadian women of influence, recognized by YWCA Women of Distinction, and three times being named among Canada's top 100 most powerful women. Congratulations. So welcome back. Oh, thank you, Margo. I'm glad to be here. I've been looking forward to this conversation. It, it's going to be fun. And I, I do have to clarify that in my um, home roost where I've been married for 30 years and I have two, I call them boys, but I guess they're young men. I am not the most powerful woman. So <laughs> just to clarify. We're going to do a follow up with your family to see what we can actually learn about that. Exactly. Uh, we're going to get started and just you and I having a conversation and we have some questions that I want to make sure that I get to selfishly ask you and we'll share your responses, of course, with the viewers. A reminder, though, that we'll open up about half past the hour to any of the viewers' questions. So please put them in the Q&A uh, as we go through this morning and I'll give you a heads up as we get close to the last question. Uh, and of course, as Laura said, this is going to be videotaped and up on YouTube. We'll finally get our YouTube following going, Beth, and, and uh, we'll be able to click here and subscribe. Um, so let's get started. Um, the first question that I want to start, let's just start pretty open. I've shared some of your accomplishments so far uh, and would really love to hear you tell a little bit about your career and some of those, those milestones, those turning points that uh, you really reflect on as being pinnacle over the last 25 years or so of your career. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So as you said, I, I spent 26 years at KPMG. So I like to say that I grew up professionally at KPMG. I joined uh, right out of university into the audit practice um, and became an audit partner in 2000. 
And as I think about uh, that and, and my, my performance during that, oh, I'm really sorry. It <laughs> sounds like here we were joking about live, Marco. Sounds like I have a uh, American uh, or a uh, Amazon delivery guy who's not going away. Um, you, I'm just going to have to grab the door. Just one second. I'm so sorry. We were just laughing as we were doing our sound and uh, video check beforehand that this is live and we never know what's going to happen. So we'll just roll with it. It'll be a couple of minutes. If anybody has a great joke, put it in the Q&A for me. I'll help to fill in the time. There, she's back. <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> that was one of those deliveries where they insist on seeing your face. So <laughs> there we go. No problem. All right. Uh, anyhow, back to what I was saying. I, I came up through the audit practice, and I was very technically strong as a, as a practitioner and recognized for that. And I, I think the first turning point in my career was when the then Toronto managing partner took me out for lunch and I was a partner by then. And he said, you know, you're at a bit of a fork here and you need to decide whether you wanna go down the path of leadership on the technical side and being known for a deep expert or leadership more down the management side, because I had also been very active in a number of committees, diversity council, recruiting, teaching, learning, et cetera. And, uh, and so I, I had to go away and really reflect on that. And I thought about individuals and leadership roles at KPMG that I saw both on both sort of sides. And, and I decided to pursue more the management side of leadership. Um, I felt that's where I could have the greatest impact and, and that's where my interest lay. It was really around leading and motivating people. So that was really, I think, a first big decision for me. And then after expressing that ambition, um, really it was a matter of time until there was an opportunity. And, and the first opportunity that came my way from our then CEO was to step into the role of, um, or sorry, at least go through the process to apply for the role of, of uh, chief HR officer. Mm -hmm. And I was young. I had only been a partner mm, a couple of years, I would say. And I had a couple of very large uh, clients. The boys were quite young. Um, you know, Brent was, uh, was active in, in his career. And the more I thought about it and the more I thought about what would be involved, I got this feeling in the pit of my stomach that wasn't, wasn't really a good feeling. So I sought out some advice from mentors and ultimately, I met with the CEO and told him that I didn't think the time was right for me to put my name into the hat. Because he had made it pretty clear that I would be expected to do that big leadership role and continue servicing my big clients. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't see how it could work because I was still figuring out how to be a really effective audit partner on large clients, how to be a mom to two young boys and make all of that work. And so I said no. And he was very, I was really scared and nervous to say no. I remember he was very understanding, um, but he did say to me, you know, sometimes when you're ready, the opportunity will no longer be there. Ouch. I know. He, he delivered a lot of ouches over the course of my career, and there were great ouches. So it was a, an, a piece of feedback that, that stuck in my mind, but I, I did believe that if you were terrific at what you did and you focused on having impact that opportunities, other opportunities would come along. Anyhow, lo and behold, two years later, the same opportunity came around for me. He was moving the then CHRO to a different leadership role. And by then, you know, the boys were older, I'd kind of got my feet grounded in, in being an audit service partner. I was feeling much more confident about that. And my husband had also made the decision at the time to leave his career at Canon and stay home with our young boys. So a lot of things had changed for me and I felt like I was ready and I stepped into, uh, into that chief HR officer role. The next big turning point for me came again from the same CEO who was terrific at delivering what I called tune-ups. And the one thing he did, he delivered two nuts without discrimination. So, you know, you read a lot in the research about how women aren't necessarily getting the right feedback yeah. at senior leadership roles in terms of what they need to do to move forward. But the men get, they get the straight, honest, hard hitting feedback, but men often hold back from delivering it to women. Bill didn't hold back. So we were having a sandwich one day and he said to me, you know, you're doing a great job as the chief HR officer. Like you've advanced a bunch of things, et cetera. 
but I didn't put you in the role so you could do a great job. He said, what's your legacy going to be? And that question has stuck with me through my whole career. And so every role I went into subsequent to that, I always thought about what's my legacy going to be? What's my impact going to be? How am I going to leave this role, this function, this charitable organization, this committee better because uh, I had been involved in, in leading it? Um, and so on the back of that, you know, I really upped my game in the last year of my tenure as CHRO in terms of some of the initiatives that we um, that we launched. The other piece of feedback I had around that time was that I needed to broaden my experience. So, you know, as you know, running an HR function is is a is a functional role. You don't have PL responsibility, even though in my mind you have responsibility for the most important thing, which is people strategy <laughs> in a firm. Um, but the feedback was you needed p &L experience. And so I was moved to run um, all of our smaller regions across the country. I used to joke and say it was everything but the big stuff. So <laughs> it was sort of 30 offices across the country, but not um, any of the four, four main ones. And that was, a, that was a really good learning experience for me because you have to think about, I was a young female, based in Toronto, and now I was leading all these regional managing partners who were predominantly white men, mid to late 50s, who were really um, kings of their local region, right? So imagine being the office managing partner in Winnipeg or Kelowna or Halifax, and all of a sudden you have this sort of young upstart female leader from Toronto who's going to, who's going to lead you. And so I had to think really carefully about how to earn their trust and how could I help them to be successful and advance what was important to them and so I did learn a lot in that role about collaboration which was which was great um, I was then moved out of that role to run Toronto and then towards the end of my time at KPMG it was CEO succession renewal time and uh, I felt very ready and definitely had aspirations to uh, to become the CEO I could just see I, I had really strong views on strategy and vision and, and felt it was um, time to lead from the top, really, and have the impact in the firm I wanted to have. So, so I entered the ring. Uh, I was the only woman in the process. Um, and it was pretty intense, uh, let me tell you, for sure. Um, you know, you think back to that time when I was going through that process, it was around the same time that Hillary Clinton was making her run for president in the US. And I remember reading about some of the things she was going through and experiencing some of that myself in terms of the double standard for women, right, in terms of, you know, too collaborative, not collaborative enough, um, you know, too, too perfect, doesn't seem human enough, is she likable? And all of these sort of questions and little rumblings of feedback out there. So, um, you know, I certainly learned a lot about courage and resilience, being a woman in a, in a reasonably um, intense and politicized process, like making a run for CEO in a professional services firm. Anyways, the long and short of that story is that I, long and short of that is that I was not selected to be the CEO. Uh, which was hugely disappointing for me because this was the institution where I had grown up um, that I loved and I really felt so passionate about making a difference in. So I did have to take a bit of time to reflect on all of that and, and how did I feel and whether I saw an opportunity for myself to continue to learn and develop and have impact at KPMG. And ultimately I made the decision to leave um, because I just didn't see that opportunity for me. And I felt like there had to be something else out there for me in terms of a change mandate. So I left without having uh, anything to go to and, and started that search process. And along came Dentons. Um, so a, a law firm and a partnership that was actually looking outside the partnership for their next CEO and God forbid, like a non-lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> to boot because you know the legal sector is a little they're 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 a little stuck um in terms of their progress compared to other professional services firms um and I think the firm really recognized that and they were looking to see if there was an outside change leader that that could come in and and help to move things forward and so 
for me, the stars aligned because here was the opportunity to, to be the CEO. It was still professional services. Mm -hmm. I completely understand a partnership culture. I understand the global grind structure of a global professional services firm. Um, and they were looking to really draw on all the experience I had from my roles at, um, at KPMG. And, and Margo, it hasn't disappointed. Um, it's a terrific firm and we've done some really exciting things together. So, you know, that's a whirlwind tour yeah. of, my, of my career over the last almost 30 years, which is hard to imagine. But. It really strikes me. I love the idea and the concept and it can apply to leaders at any level, in fact, to employees at any level of an organization around your legacy or really how are you going to leave things better than when you started, right? Whether, you know, you're just joining as a team member or taking on a team or an organization as its leader. I think that's really powerful. It's also notable to me that you, you, although you were with an organization for 26 years and then you made a huge leap, you made lots of changes in roles and in responsibilities throughout your career. And, and you know, and the feedback that I've heard certainly over the last few uh, conversations that we've had, but just over um, all of my time working with women, that's not always easy. There's something about being comfortable in your role, about excelling and, you know, feeling really comfortable there. Tell me about you know, your experience and how you really approach tackling those different roles and moving through your career that way. Yeah, you really have to be willing to take a risk. And I often think back to that, my, my young self that had that first opportunity, right, to become a CHRO. And, and I said no at the time. And I often think about not so much was it the right decision, because everything worked out well. But was it just my fear of the change and not being sort of mature enough yet in my own skin to, to take the risk or, or were the reasons valid and, you know, you shouldn't go back and second guess. But I, I often think about how I felt in that moment when I'm coaching others around taking, taking a risk, but clearly you have to take a risk. So even that first role, that was about moving from somewhere where I was a technical expert right? as the lead audit partner. I was looked to by my teams for my expertise. I had credibility and I was moving over to run a functional area where I was not a talent professional. So I understood the business and what was going to work on the ground. I understood firm strategy and I had leadership skills, but I had to adapt really quickly to the fact that I wasn't a technical expert, right? So right. again, sort of taking that risk to believe in yourself that you could lead a team of experts in an area that wasn't your home turf and that you could add value to that team as a leader and trying to figure all of that out um, or moving to run the PL, right? Where, where I was leading a group of leaders who were really at a different age and stage than, than me. So you know, I think being comfortable to let go of what has made you successful initially, whether that's technical expertise or being a great individual producer and making that first leap. And then honestly, it gets easier. Like, I think after you get through the first one, then each one becomes, it's always still a bit scary. And you always feel that imposter syndrome whenever you move into those new roles. But, but each one gets easier. And I think you build you know, you build the courage and the resilience to know that you can navigate change, right, when you step into, um, into a new role like that. Um, the other thing I would say uh, in all of that is that for these roles, it's important to understand that there's, I always call it the process behind the process. So even when I wanted to become a partner at KPMG, I remember getting the memo about the process and calling my counselor and saying, I'm ready to go through the process this year based on the feedback I received and him saying, oh, well, the process has already started and your name's not on the list this year. And I'm like, what do you mean the process has already started? And no, there was a process behind the process. And, but that holds true for all of these roles, right? And I think the more senior the role, the more sort of politicized it is. And you really, you really have to learn to be comfortable navigating that. And and I think get some thick skin, right? I, I needed pretty thick skin when I was going through for, for CEO because there are criticisms, right? And they can feel they can feel personal. And it's often not about you as a person. It might be about decisions that you made that others don't agree with. There's a lot of, lot of reasons behind that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the importance of being ready to embrace failure. 
Right. When I um, when I left KPMG, I sent a note to the um, to the female partners and I told them to embrace the F word uh, being failure uh, and, and to not be afraid to use it. Right. I, I, I said I am perfectly comfortable to say I failed at becoming, you know, the next CEO. And then what can we learn from those lessons? Right. Either personally or as an organization. And if you if you hold yourself back and you don't try, you don't put your name in the process, you don't reach, um, then you'll never, you'll never make a change and you won't, you won't advance. So you really have to be comfortable with failure um, and thinking about how you'll stay, uh, how you stay resilient through that. Yeah. One of the steps along the way, getting that PL experience, and there was a question in the chat, what does PL mean? It's the profit oh, and loss. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Um, and, and it's it's actually part of some of the research, you know, you mentioned before around advancing women, they don't always get support around, you know, what did it mean to run a business? How do you really understand the business? And of course, owning a PL about how you make money and where you're gonna fall short or have a loss or a gap is a really incredibly important part of that, right? Yeah, and, and Margot, an important part of my career story was sponsorship. And um, now that I look back on it, that CEO at the time, Bill McKinnon, he was a sponsor and that, that, that phrase didn't even exist at the time, but clearly there was a senior leader, right? Who, was, who saw potential in a, in a young leader and was willing to use his position of power and his political capital to give me the opportunity, right? He's the one that put me on that senior management team as a CHRO. He's the one that moved me over to run, you know, the, P, the, the profit and loss, the, the region, um, and it was with his backing. And I, and I always knew he had my back, but he also gave me the tune-ups to, to make sure I, I upped my game where, where I needed to. That is really critical. Yeah. And interesting, you know, for those people who are viewing this and are have the opportunity to be that kind of sponsor, your role is so critical in advancing women or any uh, group that you're trying to advance and, and increase the um, the percentages in your organization. That sponsorship we see time and time again is, if not the most important thing, one of the very most important things uh, to be successful. The critical. I'm, I'm curious. Did you know you were seeking? You said you didn't really know you were seeking out sponsorship. He may or may not have realized how instrumental he was being for for you. I suppose as well. You know, I, I think that's right. And, you know, at that stage, um, people talked about coaching and mentors. Nobody talked about sponsorship. It's That's been fairly new, right, in recent years in terms of understanding the difference between having a mentor and having a sponsor. I had lots of mentors, most of whom were men, actually, because there were not very many females in leadership roles at the time, KPMG, even not even that many women who were partners who had uh, who had families. So um, I definitely had a lot of male mentors along the way, but Bill was clearly a sponsor. That's terrific. Now you mentioned now when we spoke, you know, you were 25 years at KPMG and you found a way to be involved not only within your organization, but outside of your organization. A number of ways to gain experience and to and to be exposed to different types of leaders. Tell us about that part of your career development, if you will. Well, I'm glad you raised it. So I'm just from my portfolio, you can tell I'm passionate about the community. Um, when I'm mentoring uh, young leaders, men and women, I often recommend to them that they pursue roles in community leadership because it is a terrific way to really broaden your capabilities and often much sooner than you may get the chance inside your organization. So if you think about it, right, you can join a not-for-profit board uh, long before you may ever have the opportunity to do a presentation in front of your own company's board, right, or deal with senior leaders. So for me, it was about, um, First of all, it was about a sense of purpose in terms of engaging in things I was really passionate about. But I learned so much around those board tables, uh, either because I took on committee chair roles 
but also from just watching other leaders. So it also exposed me to CEOs in a number of different organizations who, who also became great mentors or role models uh, for me. And even today, you know, I, I sit on, um, for example, I sit on the, on the board of uh, Sick Kids Hospital, which is a great organization. And I continue to learn from watching other seasoned business leaders and directors in terms of the way, you know, they, they present or engage in, in sharing committees at the board level. So in my mind, there is so much you can learn in the context of also giving back and, and having an impact in the community. It's a great opportunity for professional development. Yeah, that's amazing. It serves so many purposes. We can learn from so many different um, parts of our, our um, how we spend our time. And uh, we find that purpose in being able to, to give back to our communities as well. This is the final question before I go to the QA. So, uh, okay, well, that's sure. gone really quick, Margo. <laughs> so, for those of you who are watching, make sure you put your questions in the QA because I can only focus on one tab at a time. Um, and this is one that I'm sure lots of people are going to be interested in. I mean, the pandemic has hit all of us very, uh, very hard. Um, women have been um, hurt more so according to the research in terms of from an employment perspective and, and mental health as well. What's your advice in today's context for, for women who are looking to advance their career or even just hang on right now? Yeah, um, I thought about this question because I have sort of my standard list of ad advice and I, I was reflecting on whether it's valid or should be different in today's context. Um, and two pieces of advice I always give, and one of which you already heard in my story is around always having impact, irrespective of the role you're in, whether you're a capital L leader or a small L leader, always have impact in the role you're in. And the second one is to articulate your ambition. You cannot assume that people understand what you wanna do with your career, what you aspire to do in your organization, what types of experiences you want. You really have to vocalize those. And so then I thought about, well, what is that like today um, when we've been, a lot of us sort of a year working virtually. And I think I would categorize that under the umbrella of don't become invisible. <laughs> Uh, I really worry, particularly um, about a number of our women, and I think about our associates, for example, working from home, and that lack of visibility to the partners who are handing out the work assignments or uh, who are making client phone calls and the associates no longer in the office in the room to, to be coached and hear the phone call. I, I do think it's really important, and it's easy, right, to retreat into yourself and your comfort zone in your home. I think, I think we need to double our efforts, um, either as, as you know, professionals and as women to make sure we're not invisible. Uh, but also as leaders, we need to create lots of opportunities for people um, to be visible. And that takes a lot of thought and effort. It's not going to happen just by chance right in the in the office anymore. And so you know, I think think about how can you how can you initiate some forums? Um, are there committees uh, that are working on things like employee engagement or new agile working model for your organization? I, whatever might be going on in your organization, I would encourage you to put your hand up and and get involved and stay visible. Set up uh, touch in coffees, right, or or mentoring coffees, conversations with other leaders um, to keep yeah. visible. Yeah, it's, a, you know, mentoring and, and sponsorship and networking, such important parts of our career, of, of fulfilling those career aspirations. And then, Margo, the other thing I was going to say is that I don't think you can do any of that unless you've looked after yourself first. And I, I always talk about personal resilience, but I think in this environment, it's, it's even more critical, right? So if we're not turning off these bloody screens, right, and putting our phones down, if we're not physically going to some kind of different space, even if it's just walking outside now that the weather's getting better, um, exercise, eating well, and, you know, drinking enough of this water stuff, um, journaling, whatever meditation, whatever it takes, it, it, it's a hundred percent more important now than it was a year ago. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. It's the same expression. You have to put your own 
your own mask on before right. you put the mask on your family, your colleagues, your neighbors. Great advice. Okay, let's get into some of the okay, uh, questions good. from folks who've written in here. Uh, related, this first one is from an anonymous attendee. Great comments on failure and taking risks. How can we change views on failure as these are truly opportunities to learn and change to improve on something? Without failing, we just keep doing the same thing. I think one of the most important things we need to do to change the attitude around failure is to story tell about it. Mm. Um, and I did not really come to that realization actually until I'd left KPMG and a couple of people asked me to share my story. And it took me a long time to figure out how to be comfortable with the story itself and tell it in a way, because I love KPMG. Um, so how do I tell a story about failure and disappointment and, and stay loyal and true to the organization where, where I grew up professionally. But I really realized that it is so important for women, and I think particularly senior women or senior leaders, to, to be authentic enough to tell their stories of failure, right? What did they, you know, where did, where did they fail? What did they learn from that? What would they do differently so that we, that we normalize it and then people can, can learn from it? And it was part of the rationale behind the email that I sent to the women partners when I left KPMG because I, I wanted them to really embrace that I tried um, and to be energized by that. You seem to very intentionally use the word failed, failure, and to be comfortable with that, really, and to, and to have others be comfortable with that, which I think is strategic on your part and is having an impact. Very interesting. All right, Melissa Robson writes, and what types of things did your leader do to increase the trust and security factor in your relationship to afford safe room to provide you such valuable and difficult feedback as a sponsor? That's a really good question. I'm, I'm trying to cast my mind back to how I felt during some of those feedback sessions. I mean, there. I think there's nothing you can... A, feed, a, a feedback session where you're getting a, a tune-up, as I call them, is going to be uncomfortable. So I think in the first instance, you just have to realize it's going to be uncomfortable because nobody likes to receive that type of feedback. But, you know, when I think about the leaders who gave me great constructive feedback, they always, they had always invested in building a personal relationship first. So they knew me as a person. Um, and I always felt like the feedback was coming because they cared about me, right? So it was coming from an authentic place of caring and wanting to make sure that, that I progressed and that I gave my best. Um, and it was provided very factually in a non-judgmental way. And then, and then we moved on from it. Uh, and then, so for every, you know, for every tune-up, there were probably five or six instances where I saw that leader had my back or they gave me kudos or, you know, I felt recognized and valued. Yeah, and that's um, the, the, it seemed like there was a balance too, in terms of being, as I said, the coach, right? So that the tune-up, but also you knew that they were doing other things to promote and sponsor your advancement. So it was, yeah. you could tell that there was a demonstration of that. Um, anonymous attendee, love everything being said. How did that resiliency come about when failure was holding you down? Um, how do you find resilience. How do you find resilience? I think I, um, I think I discovered my resilience I think I discovered my resilience was much higher than I thought. I think you build resilience over time. I, we probably underestimate, I think we underestimate the number of bumps in the road we've had uh, along the years, whether those are um, personal losses or, um, you know, other challenges we have in, in our personal lives or community lives or our professional lives. And I think we don't give ourselves enough credit for just how strong, courageous, and resilient we are. Um, I surprised myself, for example, and I've, I've talked to other women who have gone through similar experiences, and they've all said the same thing. But, but I also think you build resilience by um, lots of self-reflection -refle and being a self-aware individual. So if you've invested the time in yourself, reading, being thoughtful, um, thinking about your values, what matters most to you in life. I'm a big journaler, so I had done a lot of journaling, particularly when I was 
putting myself in the process for CEO, um, really grounded in my principles and what I believed in. And so I think then when you when you have a failure or you come across a real obstacle, you have that to fall back on. You can go back to, well, who am I as a person and what do I really believe in? And then rooted in that, you find your way forward and through through the failure. And then there's no doubt that a circle of friends and family. My boys were with me all along the way. They watched, they watched mom rehearse her pitch to the board and they were there giving me big hugs when I came home, you know, crying because I didn't get the roles. So, you know, I think pulling and allowing people to step in and support you when you need it is also really critical. Great advice. April, it's a bit of a shift for you from Maureen Solero. How are you also further integrating allyship and sponsorship with a commitment, commitment sorry, to diversity, equity, and inclusion at the firm? It's a great, that is a great question. Um, uh, and I'm conscious actually, even Margot, that we are sitting here as two white privileged women mm -hmm. having, this, having this conversation and I, I can't see the diversity of our audience. Um, this past year has been a really big year of reflection for me in terms of whether I have been doing enough as a leader around allyship and did I really understand what it means to be anti-racist? So uh, from a personal perspective, I've done a lot of reading this year and a lot of reflection and had some really honest conversations with some members of my team um, to better understand, right, the journey that they're on and, and reflect on, on what we can, uh, what we can do. Um, and I think allyship, uh, includes all of that, right? First of all, starting with yourself um, and making sure, you know, you've got your own head around what, what anti-racism means. And then, and then always thinking about, comes back to sponsorship, always thinking about how do you use your privileged position of power and influence to make a difference for those who don't have access to that privilege, right? That, that needs to be front and center in everything that you do. Perfect. It's definitely been a year of enlightenment. And when you think about reflection for resilience, reflection to really understand who you can be as an authentic leader for diversity, equity, and inclusion, also really important. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Tracy Chen writes, what techniques did you use to build the trust and collaboration when you led old, more tenured men as a young female in a senior role? I expect that there are a number of people watching who have been in similar positions or who are currently. Uh, I started with listening and I can say it was the same when I, when I came to Denz and, and trust me, there were a lot of raised eyebrows about, a, a, I think about a female accountant coming to run lawyers who, who aren't, well, I can't even run lawyers, come to run a law firm who, who uh, aren't keen on being managed. Uh, I always start from a position of listening and curiosity. So investing a lot of time up front, listening, understanding the views of, in that, in that case, the regional leaders uh, around what was going well for them in their region. Um, what did they think uh, we could do differently and better as a team? What did success look like for them as a team in three years time? And then really collaborating and engaging them in the process of setting the strategy uh, and agreeing as a team what we were going to do going forward. And then uh, in the case of that regional role, demonstrating to them that I could add value to them by being a strong advocate for that region's practice at the senior executive table because, because those practices were smaller. Uh, mm -hmm. I demonstrated to them that I, would, I could take their issues and be a champion for the regions and, and get changes made within KPMG that were of benefit to the regions. And I think when they saw me using my voice at that table in support of them and the team's objectives, that made a big difference. And I think the same for the HR function, actually, when I, when I um, took over as the chief HR officer during that period of time. Um, you know, and then obviously focusing on early wins wherever, wherever I could. So the ability to tick the box pretty quick in the, mm -hmm. in the first couple of months on, uh, on a couple of wins, then builds that trust so you can, uh, you can go from there. Terrific. Good advice. The listening, you know, it's, it's, I think if I went back and listened to all five of the conversations we've had this year, 
it's come up has been especially an important part of um, leading around DE and I as well. Uh, okay, there's questions in here, uh, not surprising around, how do you find time for everything? So what advice do you have for a new leader when it comes to finding healthy work-life balance? How do you maintain work-life balance with work and community engagement? All right, time to spill it. What's the secret? <laughs> well, I don't actually believe in the phrase work-life balance, right? To me, it's it's all, it's your integrated life. Um, so first of all, you have to be engaging in things that are meaningful to you, right? So it's easier to prioritize spending time on a community board if you're a big believer in the organization you're supporting, if it feeds your soul by being engaged, if it's giving you something different and additive than you're getting in your professional life. Um, and same professionally, right? If you are learning and developing and you are enjoying the challenges and it's easier to make some of those day-to-day -day decisions you have to make around, around trading off. I, I think the other thing with work-life integration is that it's not a point in time, right? At any point in time, there's something probably out of balance, right? You've had a busy week of meetings and skipped two of your workouts or, um, you've made the trade-off decision about attending a soccer game versus being at a at an important work function or mm -hmm. vice versa. And, and so I, one of the things I learned over time is that you can't beat yourself up on a day-to-day -day basis, but what you really need are those check-ins. Maybe it's at the end of the week on a Sunday night when you reflect on the week gone by and the week coming up, or maybe it's once a quarter. You do those mm -hmm. check-ins with yourself to say, is this, is this okay? Like, Am I on, have I crossed my line in the sand for too much time? Are there relationships in my life that are suffering because I'm not investing enough, whether those are work relationships or family relationships? And, and then I think the other really important thing is, and it depends on age and stage, um, having the perspective that your career is really long. <laughs> you have a really long timeline to do all kinds of amazing things in your professional journey. And I think women can put a lot of pressure on themselves to get it all done in a really short period of time and pressure to advance at some predetermined pace, which how do you do, frankly, when you have really young children and a, and a family? And I think if we just were patient with ourselves and recognize that we have a really long journey ahead of us and lots of opportunities to do everything, but maybe not just do everything all at the same time. Right, right. It, there are phases as we move forward, right? There are phases that we need yeah. to go through and, and realize that different priorities in different phases. And you have to be willing to ask for help, um, to pay for help, to delegate things that you don't need to be doing, recognizing they won't be done perfectly or the same way you would do them. But the power of delegation and really thinking about what should I be spending my time on as opposed to my team or others in my family or, or whatever the case may be, that's really critical as well. Terrific. Okay, Barbara Quinn, you might know her. Barb oh, says Oh, Barb, that. there we go, an old friend. I you can't see you, Barb, but hello. <laughs> you did amazing things at CHRO because you weren't traditional. What's one thing women need to get better at to move up the ranks? Hmm. Um, being confident in exactly what Barb is, is talking about, being confident that you can lead differently, you can lead authentically, and you should bring fresh ideas and stop trying to mimic or just replicate or do incrementally better what a male leader had done before you. I think having that faith in yourself that you can lead differently, collaborate differently, and get amazing results. Bravo, love it, love it. Um, okay, there's so many questions here, okay. What advice, oh, interesting, okay. So sorry, different time. What advice would you give to someone of a similar age, feeling like they are running out of time to hit some key milestones? Make a change, mm -hmm. for sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's kind of blunt, but. <laughs> I, honestly, I think a lot of women um, our age do a lot of reflection around where are they at in their professional and personal lives. They think about, you know, their runway, 
And what do they want that portfolio of experiences to look like? I see a lot of women in our age group transitioning to different roles, different organizations, different mm -hmm. approaches, portfolio careers for that very reason. So I would say, you know, if you're feeling that way, then really speak your ambition and the organization you're in or, or think about whether it's time for a change. You say it so matter of factly, speak your ambition. Hmm. I'm guessing, I know that there are women out there that say, what do you mean? Like even reflecting enough to understand and get comfortable with having ambition is not always easy. What's your experience with that then? Yeah, I learned a lot about that through a program called the Judy Project. And I don't know how many of your listeners are familiar with that, Marco, but it's an executive program for women uh, at Rotman. And it was uh, built in honor of Judy Elder, who was this fabulous leader um, uh, from Microsoft. I'd encourage everyone to Google the Judy Project and uh, Judy Elder's speech and read her speech. And she talks about ambition and how that has been such a dirty word for women, right? Oh, she's ambitious. And, and you really learn at the Judy Project to, to speak your ambition and embrace ambition. And when I say ambition, I mean, I don't mean ambition in terms of, I want this role with this title, but I mean ambition in terms of what's the impact that you want to have and where do you see the opportunity to do that in your organization? Um, what's your ambition for your team, right? For your function, what's your ambition for the organization and really, and then what's your, what, what's the role you can play in helping to achieve that? And so that ambition might just be to get a seat at the table on a particular committee, right? Where you are a big believer in what that committee is trying to do and you have great ideas and, and value to add. So when I say speak ambition, I mean um, vocalize that. So to uh, others around you, to senior leaders in your organization, to mentors, to sponsors, um, don't just keep it to yourself or, you know, I put it in your annual sort of, you know, performance evaluation, self-assessment, goal setting document, whatever that looks like in your organization, but really take the opportunities to say it out loud. That's what I mean. Yeah. I have seen so many women who have just, by the virtue of being encouraged to do that, get a promotion, get the job they never thought they could get. Uh, get an opportunity even to work with a mentor or a sponsor that they didn't think would be possible. And so figuring out how to articulate that and be comfortable with ambition, abso absolutely huge. That's terrific. Um, what's a good way to make sure you're getting good feedback if you feel like it's being withheld from you as a woman? You touched a little bit on, up front around how some men feel less comfortable providing the goods to women. Yeah, it's a great question. I can think of examples when I um, when I have uh, mentoring coffees, for example, with associates in our firm who aspire to be partners, and they'll say, you know, I don't know why my name isn't going forward yet, and I have really good evaluations. And my feedback to them is, don't leave your performance conversation, your year-end conversation, without specific, actionable, tangible feedback on what you can be doing better or differently. There is, there is constructive feedback for everybody. I don't care how great a superstar you are or how well you're doing in your, in your role, particularly if you have ambitions to do something different. I, you know, my, uh, I always say the onus is on you to keep pushing uh, for that feedback and proactively asking it. And if, if you're not getting it from the individual, um, uh, who sort of has that formal responsibility, then try to find it elsewhere. So think about somebody else who observes you in action or who, you know, sees the impact of your work or who has followed a similar career path and go for a coffee and ask them for honest feedback. I think it's important that we all search out those individuals who will always call up sort of holding the mirror up to you, right? The, there's different forums where you have people who will hold that honest, you know, hold that mirror up for you and, and give you some honest uh, input on what you could be doing differently or better. And, and I think as a leader, acknowledging to your team that you're open to that feedback and you want that feedback and making it safe for them to provide you with that feedback is also um, really important. 
Yeah, terrific. And some cultures are better at it than others. You can even use mechanisms like 360s for Absolutely. some of that anonymity and, and being able to get it as well. Uh, here's something for you. When I speak up and try to have my voice heard amongst male colleagues, I'm told I'm too emotional. How can I get my point across without being seen as too emotional? Well, there is a really good example of what I was talking about earlier in terms of that double standard. Um, yeah. Because you may see a male colleague do the same thing and, and uh, would be described sort of passionate, passionate and committed to his views or um, persuasive. <laughs> so um, I guess, first of all, don't label yourself as, as too emotional. Um, all that being said, I think that if in a particular uh, working team or environment, the manner in which you're trying to get your point across isn't landing, you do need to do some reflection around what, why, why is that? And I, I wouldn't slap a label on it like too emotional, but, but maybe take the time to watch others and think about how are others getting their, getting their point across persuasively? Um, and is there, is there something different that you need to do? We all have to adapt our style depending on the room we're in. Um, the cultural norms and what seems to be most effective in terms of in terms of persuading people. If it's a topic, I, I can get quite emotional too. And, and earlier in my career, in my leadership career, um, often too with with women, if you're getting angry about something. So if you're in a more of a heated exchange and angry, that can manifest itself basically almost into tears or sometimes tears. Um, so I think it is also helpful to play the conversation out before you get in the room and allow yourself to experience some of those emotions ahead of time so that when you're in the room, you're prepared for that, right? If you know the conversation might get heated or, or feel personal, having played the conversation out ahead of time and almost coached yourself ahead of time in terms of how you're going to react or how you're going to deflect that and keep moving through it. Um, can also be helpful. And again, uh, try to find a trusted colleague in the room, right? Who can give you, who can give you some feedback that would be helpful. Yeah. As you feel that kind of building up, once you get comfortable and, and can actually identify it happening, you can take strategies too to just breathe a little differently, exactly. stand your feet down to get grounded a bit. Yeah. And it's not that emotions are bad. Like I'm with you. I think that they're, they are a sign that you're committed, that you're passionate um, but you want to make sure that people can hear your messages yeah. and you can have the impact. Get up and take a glass of water, do something to kind of break that dynamic. And then sometimes it can't be, sometimes your voice just can't be heard in the room because it's not the right time and place or others emotionally aren't there, aren't ready to hear the message. And so uh, my other piece of advice is it doesn't end in the room. Um, you can find other opportunities to then go speak to individuals one-on-one, -on -one, you know, work the room outside the room, maybe one-on-one -on -one conversations will help to advance people along in terms of your views. I think there are lots of ways you can follow up outside of the room as well. I don't, I don't think you need to feel like the conversation has ended um, in the room. Interesting. There's a similar one here. How have you prepared for and moved through difficult conversations with very difficult men? Who do not provide safe space? Have you ever left a conversation because the space was too aggressive to be productive? I have certainly, um, actually I can think of a recent phone call. I have certainly said to somebody, we'll continue this conversation when you can be more professional. Hmm. Call me when you're ready. Now, maybe that is easier to say <laughs> when you have the CEO title, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I, I can think of a number of occasions where I, I have said to somebody, this is getting to the point where it's not constructive, you're not being professional, and so let's resume the conversation um, uh, at a later point and just end the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I will call people out on language as well. So if you think about, um, I mean, often I find aggressive conversations will start to involve could start to involve a lot of swearing depending on culture and mm -hmm. you know if if that is uh making you uncomfortable and aggressive then I think you should just call it out right thank you um there's a, a question here from Michelle Bailey this might be a quick one I'm not sure do you have a personal coach or mentor and if not 
can you please indicate a couple of coaching books for reference? Maybe you've got some favorite self-help oh, or leadership books. books. So I've had lots of coaches. Um, I've had I've had lots of mentors over the course of my career, and I've also used um, professional coaches as well at various stages of my career, often in connection with uh, various leadership programs that I was involved in. Uh, mm -hmm. But I also used uh, professional support when I was making that transition uh, from KPMG as well. And, and uh, it was just incredibly helpful. So I'm a big believer in executive coaching and, and professional coaching at, at different stages of your career. Coaching books. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I can think of a coaching book, but I have favorites. I should look back. I'm just going to look back on my, <laughs> look back on my shelf. I guess it depends on the topic, right? So if it's leadership, I'm a huge fan of um, Simon Sinek, for example, um, Clay Christensen as well. Um, How will you measure your life? And these are, these are some of the books that I did a lot of reading, um, did a lot of reading when I was on my sabbatical before going through the CEO process at KPMG. If you're in transition, there's a couple of great books out there on transition. Um, there's one, I can't remember the name now. I wish I could. There was a great exercise in there about writing down everything that you're feeling in terms of loss as you're, as you're transitioning and get it all out of your system and then read it and then tear the paper up. I don't know. Books like that, that yeah. kind of give you some good exercises to go through are, are helpful um, if you're dealing with, if you're trying to learn a lot about change, the Cotter books are great as well. Yeah. yeah. The classics. Some of the classics. They absolutely. Are. Yeah. You mentioned the Judy project, um, and you've mentioned leadership development as being important to you. Questions in here around, you know, is there a place for women only programs? Are they all to be mixed men and women? Um, what's some of your philosophy or experience that way? So I think you need both um, for sure. And I've participated in both. So at KPMG, it was in a number of programs um, that were that were men and women. Um, but I loved, I mean, the Judy project was really a unique experience for me. I loved the safe environment of being with other women executives who were really exploring what ambition meant. And it was a comfortable place to articulate um, what was going well in their careers, what they, where they aspired to be, and to really get courage from each other. And also talk about, because there are, women do have unique experiences as leaders and in the workplace. And so it was a great environment to share all of that and realize you're not alone in what you experience, right? So it really helped to normalize uh, the experiences you were having and provide you with that venue to, to speak to others who had similar experiences. But, um, but I think you need both, right? Because you need to build those relationships with men as well. And there's so much we can learn from our male colleagues and, and vice versa. Terrific, totally agree. We've reached the end of our time. The hour has flown by, but thank you so much for sharing uh, your story, your transparency. Uh, I really am impressed by the amount of insights and reflection that you have um, really taken good care of yourself through your journey and, and stayed authentic to what's important to you and been really mindful of that. Just before we close up, though, what are your final words of wisdom, speaking of insights, that uh, you'd like to share? Uh, you know, go off the call and give yourselves a big hug. <laughs> because as far as I'm concerned, everybody's a hero uh, these days, no matter what you're dealing with professionally and your family and your family life as we enter, um, you know, the second year of what we're going through. Um, uh, I guess if there is one takeaway, I would ask people to try to build the opportunity in their day or their week for more self-reflection. If I were to pick one thing that has made a really big difference for me, it's it has been around developing that muscle for self-reflection and self-awareness um, in really coming to terms with who I am and being comfortable with that. Terrific advice. Thank you again so very much, Beth. It's been an absolute privilege. Um, and I know that our viewers have gained an absolute uh, tremendous amount of information and inspiration from you. Have a great day. Thanks very much, Margo. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. This is the fifth and final for 2021. Take care and have a great day, everybody.